Well, Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, we are continuing our summer series, which has been called Fight Club. This is week number five of this series. We've been talking about spiritual warfare this summer, and go figure, some of us in our church family, as we've been talking about spiritual warfare, have been facing it. I had some people tell me, uh, you know, it's almost like they're upset with me that I've been preaching about spiritual warfare because it was like I turned on the attention or something. Can I just tell you, the point of this whole series has not been that uh, spiritual warfare is seasonal, but that you are all in a fight for your faith all the time, whether you want to admit it or not. Because we have a devil, but there, we don't have a devil, but there is a devil uh, who hates us. He cannot stand you, whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe in the devil or not. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. He's real and he cannot stand you. And the whole reason he exists is to steal from you, to destroy your life, and if he can, to kill you. But we read in the Bible right after those words in John chapter 10, verse 10, that Jesus, he said, but I have come that they, who's they, people who would believe and put their faith in Jesus, they might have life and life more abundantly or life to the fullest. In one translation, it says life overflowing, so more than the fullest, right? So we want to talk about what kind of person we need to be, what kind of mentality we need to have, what are the kinds of things that we need to do if we want to win the fight for our faith. Because the devil's trying to take out your faith. We want you to be in God's fight club and win the fight for your faith. So we've been talking about this week. We've been talking about that a lot this summer. And so whether or not you feel like the heat got turned up when we started talking about fight club, maybe you've just been more aware that you've been fighting all along. And maybe some of us for the first time ever or for the first time in a long time have actually started fighting the fight of faith. And can I just say, if you've started practicing the fight of faith, if you've been putting on the armor of God since we started this series, or like we learned last week, if you've been praying in the spirit since last Sunday and we talked about what that means, then God is so proud of you. He's so excited about what he's now able to do in and through your life because you are joining the fight club. So good job, but let's keep going. Amen. Amen. Well, in Second Chronicles, we're going to walk through a story today that's going to take us through a sermon that I am calling Fight Songs. And I got to confess to you, I thought of the title Fight Songs, and I thought, man, this is super manly and masculine fight songs. And I was thinking about how the World Cup has been happening, and I've been watching the World Cup, and I was rooting for Germany, and they got knocked out, but that's okay because I was also rooting for England, and then they had to settle for fourth place. And I won't tell you the result of the final if you recorded it. I don't know if you're, you're American, you probably don't care. But um, anyway, I was rooting for some teams and I was paying attention to everything that was happening during the presentation of the World Cup. And, and, and I noticed how in the crowd during the England games, there was a couple of different fight songs that were happening. A fight song is the thing that you have that like rallies the team and gets everybody pumped up, right? It's the fight song. And if you, you know, you went to a, a college in the United States of America, there's a good chance that you know your school's fight song, right? And they sing that like at the, at, at the football games, American football, not real football. I mean, they probably also sing it at the real football games, but you probably didn't attend those. Uh, that's okay. You probably know the fight song for the school that you went to. And, and I was thinking about fight songs, and I was thinking about how in the English games they were singing, uh, they were singing a, a song called It's Coming Home because they were so excited. It actually started out as a joke because England's been awful in the World Cup for the last, like, forever. And so they were thinking, like, oh, yeah, it's coming home, kind of singing it, like, tongue-in-cheek. And then they realized that they had a really good team in the World Cup, so they started singing It's Coming Home with some meaning and conviction, and it became a fight song. And they sang it to rally the team, and it was working, and it was awesome. And then when they would win, they would sing, like, like Hail Britannia, which is a very British thing to do, and it's a song about how, you know, they like rule the world, and it's very, very British mentality to have. And so they would sing these fight songs, and I thought, I'm gonna name this message Fight Songs, and it's gonna be super manly and awesome. And I told Sharon about it, I told my wife about it this morning, and she's sitting in my office, and she starts singing this pop song about how this is my fight song, and I thought, no, that ruins the whole thing just ruins the whole thing. So I'm a little bit disappointed in my sermon title today. I should have thought this out better and come up with something a little bit. No, it's okay. Because actually, the great thing is that no matter how you view the world, whether you're super masculine or, or not, that's okay. You can have a fight song. In fact, I want to talk to you about three fight songs that you should have today 
that you need to have if you are going to win your fight. And the purpose of these fight songs are number one, to help us find courage for our fight, number two, to equip us to win our fight, and number three, to celebrate our victories. So fight songs all around. Whether you're in a fight, coming up to a fight, or you want to fight, won a fight, not want to fight. You have recently been victorious in a fight. You need a fight song. So my goal today is to encourage you to engage in this, praise and worship. My goal today is to encourage you to in, engage in praise and worship as a function of spiritual warfare. Last week we talked about how prayer is our battle cry. We should pray in the spirit at all times. It says that in Ephesians six eighteen that we should always pray at all the time in the spirit. And we learned about what that means. Well, you also need to make sure that you are engaging in praise and worship all the time if you want to win your fight. Now, let me just define the terms, and I won't go super deep into these definitions. I'll just give you an idea that these two words, praise and worship, are not exactly the same thing. They're kind of the same idea, but not exactly the same. Now, there are 13 Greek and Hebrew words that I'm aware of that are translated into the words praise and worship in English. And, and in our modern day church culture, when we say praise and worship, we just think that's two fancy words that mean the same thing. And what we think that means is when a band gets up in front of a bunch of people and plays some songs. That's actually what we culturally assume is praise and worship. But if you give the idea, if you dig into the idea of praise and worship and really give it its full meaning, the word praise is a unique activity. It is the act of singing and playing instruments in God's honor. It's something you physically, tangibly do. You make noise with your voice and with instruments in God's honor. Praise is a declaration of God's character and his goodness. So praise is any time that you say out loud or you sing out loud truth about God's goodness and his character and who he is. So if what you're singing is not true about God, then that's just a song. That's not praise. You understand? Uh, and then it is also thankfulness for God's active love for us. In other words, anytime God does something for you, praise is when you say thank you to God for what he has done for you, right? Now, for the record, you are praising all the time. The question isn't, are you praising? It's who are you praising? Are you praising God, right? Like when your spouse or when your mom or your boss or your neighbor, when somebody does something nice for you and you say thank you or you post that nice little thing you did on Facebook about how you want to say thanks to so-and-so on their birthday, that's a, an, an act of praise. The question isn't, are you praising? It's, who are you praising? Praise is something that we do. It's something we engage in. Now, worship is, if you look at the, the original Hebrew word, it actually paints a picture of a person kneeling down before a king. In fact, one word even gives the idea, the, the visual picture of a, of a dog kneeling down before their master. And, and the idea is that we would have this image in our minds that we are so much lower than the God that we are giving worship to. So it is a little bit having to do with action and activity, but it's more to do with posture. Uh, it is a position of kneeling or a posture of being humble before a king. And then if you really study the word, what you begin to realize is that worship is not just a thing we do, it's a mentality, and it's a lifestyle. It's a way that we live so that through our lives, our lives would be submitted to God and that our lives would give honor to God. So praise is something we do. We make noise and we sing and we say things that are true about God. We play instruments and we do praise like we did already in this service. And worship is any time we are engaging in going low and submitting and recognizing that God is higher than us and that we live submitted to his will and his ways and we do what he tells us to do. That's an act of worship. It's actually a lifestyle or a heart of worship. Now, a fight song is the praise and worship that you engage in specifically related to a spiritual fight. So if you feel like you're going through some kind of spiritual warfare right now, you've got some mountain that you're climbing uh, or facing, some struggle that you've got in your relationship with God or in your spiritual walk, uh, the fight song is the praise and worship you do while you're thinking and praying about that issue, right? That's what I want to talk to you about today. And to do that, I want to read to you this story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we'll pick up the story in verse 13. Let me give you a little bit of context. 
This is going to be a big shock to you. If you've ever read the Bible, if you know anything about the nation of Israel, the, the Jewish people, this can be really surprising to you. They were about to get into a fight. <sighs> Again. Here's, here's the nation of Israel's history. Uh, God says something. We give him praise and honor. We worship and honor him, and we live respectfully for a hot minute, and then we decide not to because we just get tired, get distracted. Squirrel, and we just worship somebody else. And then God gets upset about that, and then something bad happens. Uh, that's one of the things that happens, and then, and then the people repent, and then they turn back to God. Another thing that happens is everything's awesome, they've got peace, and then the devil doesn't like that, and he's trying to destroy God's people, and so he sends somebody to try and take them out. And so constantly you're seeing this cycle of God's people uh, failing to honor God and being attacked by, uh, in the New Testament context, we would call this being attacked by the devil. Being, people being used by the devil to attack God's people, right? Uh, so those are two kind of cycles that we see, and we're about to jump right into the middle of one of those cycles. There's this uh, group of armies that are coming to attack the people of Israel, and Jehoshaphat was the king at the time. He goes to God, and he asks him, what in the world should I do? Help us. He cries out to God, and then there's this guy who speaks up on God's behalf. He has what we would call a prophetic word, uh, and we can read about that in verse uh, 13, where Jehaziel stands up. It says, as all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children. So like everybody's here wondering what's about to happen in this moment. The spirit of the Lord came upon one of them standing there. His name was Jehaziel. It gives you a little bit of his lineage. And then in verse 15, it says this. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. That's a good word. Let's keep reading. It says, tomorrow, this is Jehaziel, still going on. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. Isn't that awesome that God, like, knows the demographics and the, and, and the, and the geography? He's like, hey, just so you know, this spot right here, that's where you're going to want to go. Right? God's leading every element of this moment, right? Now, it says this in verse 17, but you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Now, that's awesome. That's a great promise. That, that, that's, a, again, a prophetic word. Prophetic word just means it's God saying something, and then a person who heard it or sensed it or felt this word, uh, they said what God is saying. That's a prophetic word. And so Jehaziel stands up, he gives this prophetic promise about, the, about the, the fight that is coming, right? And now, here's where the first fight song comes in, is right here in verse 18. Watch the response. The fight hasn't even happened, this overwhelming army. Everything says that they're going to lose. It's going to be awful. The people of Israel are going to be wiped out. But God gives this prophetic word. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. So that's what happened. Instead of freaking out anymore because they were worried about what was going to happen tomorrow, they get a prophetic word through this guy named Jehaziel, and then they worship God before the battle ever starts. The first fight song that we need to engage in is that we need to make sure we're hearing what God is saying and praising him for the promise that he would give us before the fight ever starts. Uh, we've been talking about relationships a little bit throughout this series and how interesting it is that a lot of times we go into a moment where we feel like there's some conflict coming and we panic. We freak out a little bit. We don't know what to do and we start having conversations. You ever done this thing where you're knowing, you know you're going to go have a confrontation talk with somebody and you've already had that conversation in your mind 
at least five times, let's be honest, at least five times a minute, right? I'm going to say this, and, th and then they're going to say this, and if that's what they say, then I'm going to say this. And, but then if they actually say this, then I'm going to say this. And then if they try to stick it to me here, I'm going to lay this one on them. Right? Man, I, I have such a good imagination that I actually could close my eyes and play out exactly how a conflict is going to happen before I ever even see the person. And what we learn from this first fight song is that to try to play out a conversation or to try to play out a fight before it starts is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. Before a fight begins, we need to pursue what God would say, not to try to clarify what I will say. And then once we've heard what God will say, our response needs to be to praise Him because of what He said. So that's what we need to do before the fight ever starts, right? Most, the, mo the most significant thing that happens in the entire story is that the people of God chose to worship instead of worry, right? The Levites stood to praise and give a, a loud shout. And I love that it says that Jehoshaphat bows down and then all the people of Judah and Jerusalem bowed down. And then the Levites, the people who were skilled musicians, they got up and they started playing and singing in loud shouts, right? Everybody did their part so that this was a communal moment of praise and worship. And the fight hasn't even started it. Nothing has changed. No report came in that, that they, oh, it turns out that two of the armies left and now it's just you and one other arm. None of, none of that happened. Nothing physically changed except Jehaziel stood up, gave a prophetic promise, and they chose to believe that it was true. So when God gives you a promise, your response should be to praise and worship. Right? So praise means to thank Him for the promise right when you hear it as if you've already received it. But then worship means that you have to position yourself so that you can actually receive the promise. Think about this. If God had told Pastor Josh that he was going to be a pastor of a local church, right? And, 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 then, and then Josh goes, oh, thank you, Lord, for your promise, and then just sits and plays FIFA on his couch for four years. He would have not, I mean, that would have been fun, right, Josh? He's probably thinking, like, I, I might want to actually go do that. But he wouldn't have positioned himself to receive the promise. And in doing that, you can thank God all you want for something he's promised to give you and not actually do your part to position yourself to receive it. So what did Josh do? He became a worshiper by submitting himself to the promise. He received the word, you're going to be a pastor one day, and he went, okay, got it, God. Now I know how to go worship that out. And what does worship that out look like? I'm going to submit my life because to do that, I'm going to go to Bible college. I'm going to go learn what I need to learn. I'm going to submit myself to living in a dorm room for a couple of years. He didn't want to do that. I remember talking to him. I had to twist his arm just to go back and live on campus that last semester. You're welcome. But his commitment to be a worshiper in the promise is what put him here on this stage today to be appointed as a recipient of the promise. Don't ever think that God gives you a promise that you don't have to worship through. I think a lot of times we wait for God to give us everything, and then we say thank you. And what Jehoshaphat teaches us here is that not only will I speak my thanks to you, my body will align with my thankfulness. And I will submit and worship out my walk, and I'll do what it takes to get to receive the promise. Now, what I just told you is that living in the fullness of the kingdom and spiritual warfare is hard work. And I just want to tell you, the easiest thing you could ever do is to become a Christian. But to live as one should be the hardest thing you will ever do. Because it means you have to try at stuff. And it means you have to do things you don't want to do. Somebody revealed to me just recently why I don't have a six-pack. They said, because you have to give up stuff that you love and be disciplined and work really hard. That's why when I was going to the gym with Dante all the time, he ditched me and he went to a different gym 
because I wasn't showing up and I wasn't as committed as he was to the process, right? And he told me that to my face. He's like, I'm breaking up with you, man. You're not a faithful gym attender. You're not as committed because I wasn't worshiping out, right? You, you see it? I wasn't doing the hard work. All right, I won't, I won't take more time on that. Let's, let's move forward. But I will just I will say this. I think this is important. The songs you sing before the fight will determine your fate. The songs that you sing before the fight will determine your fate. If you sing songs about, this is going to be awful, we're going to lose, guess what it's going to be? And guess what you're going to be? A loser having gone through an awful experience because the praise that you sing before the fight is going to determine the fate. And a lot of times we, and Christians do this, we think that we're immune. We think that we can just ignore the devil, except we spend a lot of time talking to him. And remember I told you it's not about whether or not you praise. It's about, whether, it's about who you praise. And, and I know this is going to sound weird, but you may have done it, and I've done it. There are times where we actually get caught up in praise of the lie and not the God who's supposed to deliver us. How do we do that? When the lie comes in and goes, you stink at life. There's no way you're going to accomplish that goal. We praise the lie and give honor to the liar when we go, man, yeah, I stink at life. There's no way. And our words become a declaration of what we have chosen to be truth even though we actually know a greater truth do you understand this is why it's so important that before the fight ever starts you have to find out what god is saying and speak that as truth no matter what it looks like right because the praise that you sing before the fight will determine your fate and sometimes our, our first fight song needs to sound something like what Jehoshaphat said, what, what uh, verse 20 looks like. In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen to what he says. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets. Remember, he's saying, remember what Jehaziel said to us yesterday, and you will succeed. He's declaring truth, right? Hey, I know the sun has gone down and come back up again. Don't let the passage of time cause you to forget the promise that we heard. Remember that worship service we had yesterday spontaneously when we heard the word and we did the right thing, we all praised? Don't forget that promise. Why is that important? Because when God says something, it usually doesn't make sense, and it usually doesn't match what you see, and so it's important that you remind yourself of what God said all the time because your brain is trying to fall into rhythms of logic. And so what you need to do is use your mouth to override the rhythm of logic that your brain is trying to force your life into. Because you'll go to sleep tomorrow and you'll wake up the next day and go, everything's just the way it's just always terrible again. You know, I know church was good yesterday, but it's just terrible again. No, you need to learn a new rhythm of praise and worship for what the promise that you've heard is supposed to sound like. Amen? So a good pre-fight song is both a declaration and a reminder. Now, the, fact, the, the, the second fight song, fight song number two, is, it begins in verse 20 there where early the next morning, uh, Jehoshaphat tells him, believe in the Lord, believe in his prophets. You'll be able to stand firm and succeed. And then it continues uh, on. I want to read to you verses 21 through 24. We'll see what happens next. It says, after consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. They grabbed a hold of something true and they sang that. Notice they didn't even sing about the enemy army. Why? Because yesterday God told them this isn't even your fight. So just sing the promise, right? Just sing the truth. Going on, verse 22. Listen to this. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. 
the armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began to attack each other. Here's the key. This is awesome. So when, verse 24, so when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw, meaning they didn't see anything other than this, all they saw were dead bodies laying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. Wow. Watch, watch the breakdown. Worshippers were appointed by the leader uh, because a good fight song requires intentionality. What, what does that mean? Because when you're going into a fight, you know what's happening? Your adrenaline's pumping. Uh, some of us are going to get nervous. Some of us are going to be really tempted. I know the king just stood up like five minutes ago and said, don't forget the thing we heard yesterday that caused the spontaneous praise service. I, I know he just told us not to forget, but I'm, oh man, I, like I can, I can just feel it in the air. It's, I'm, I'm just nervous. I'm, I'm scared. And, and I, I know I'm supposed to. I, I know I'm supposed to praise God, and I know I'm supposed to listen to the music and, and all. But I'm just scared if we refuse to engage in the fight song all the way through. Don't, it's really easy for us to get distracted. So it's important that we start before the fight ever begins, so that we can continue. But it requires intentionality because if you live in fear, it's very hard to go from fear to praise without intentionality. In fact, I might say it's impossible. It's impossible to go from fear to praise without intentionality. Intentionality means choosing, purposing, forcing the issue. You can't, you can't get from fear to praise without forcing the issue. Uh, in other words, let me say it to you this way. Praise and worship is not about, con it's not about emotion, it's about conviction. What, what do I believe is going to happen? I'm going to praise because of what I believe. I'm going to praise because of what I know or because of what I've heard from God, not about what I'm feeling. Can I tell you that it has been a mistake of the church in modern day American church culture uh, to try to compel people with emotion to praise and worship? Now, I'm not saying that praise and worship doesn't produce an emotional response. And I'm also not saying that that emotional response is inherently bad. I'm not telling you that the things that you feel can't be trusted. I'm telling you that that's not the reason we worship. And if, if you're waiting to feel good about something to praise God, then you're going to be waiting for a long time. And can I just tell you, like, the only way to ever be a worshiper at that point is to shut yourself off from the entire world, never watch the news on any network, delete your Instagram, your Twitter, your Snapchat, your Facebook, get, don't cancel your newspaper subscription, don't talk to anybody ever, and only ever read the good Psalms. This is it. Which, by the way, if you live that way, you're wrong because you also have a great commission to fulfill where you have to go out and actually know people and help people be led to Jesus. So, so even the lifestyle where you block yourself off from all the bad stuff and all the sin and filth and pain in the world so that you can just be in a good mood all the time so that you can have the bandwidth to worship is actually a sinful life because you're not engaging in the Great Commission. So you are required to overcome emotion and worship and praise God based on conviction. Conviction in what? The truth about Jesus Christ, that he's alive and that we win at the end and you can win today. Amen? All right. So now the result of the people's praise was miraculous. It says, at the very moment they began to sing, the enemy attacked themselves. Because a good fight song is going to confuse your enemies, right? I was listening to a story, a preacher was telling this crazy story. There was this lady uh, years ago in his ministry, and this is a well-known preacher. If I told you who it was, you would know exactly who I'm talking about. And this person was saying that at one point earlier on in his ministry, he had this, this, female, who start, this female stalker and just was like, doing crazy, crazy stuff, like showing up in his backyard in the middle of the night, scaring his family, threatening his wife's life, said things like, your, your wife is going to die, and my husband is going to die, and then God's going to have us be married to each other. It's crazy stuff, right? Just crazy stuff. And he was, he was getting all kinds of upset, and it was like scary. Now, he's fine. Everybody's family's fine. It worked out. Uh, he's okay. 
story has a happy ending. But here's how this story took a turn for him. I just heard him tell this story recently. He was saying, I talked to one of my pastors, and I was saying, what do I do? Because I'm freaking out here. Like, I, I don't know. How do, how do I fix this issue? It's scaring my wife. It's, it's, it's not okay. I can't even sleep at night because of this person, right? And, and the, the, this mentor said to, to this pastor, he said, uh, and she would call the house. She, she had his number somehow, and she would call the house. And he, he said, the next time that she calls the house, pick up the phone, and while she's listening, praise God. So he did that. She called. He picked up the phone. He started praising God, just singing whatever worship song came to his mind, right? He just worshiping God. Guess what? She never called back again. Because it's the most confusing thing in the world. I showed up for a fight, and you're praising God? Try it. Now, be careful where you try it. This could get you fired. So use wisdom while you do this, right? So, like, the next time the boss tries to come and correct you and he's, like, within his rights to correct you because he did something wrong, don't start worshiping in that moment, right? Take the correction and do the thing right at work. But I'm talking about, like, you're in the middle of a conflict and you see, like, we are in this fight. I do not know how this is going to go except that... God gave me a promise. I praised him for the promise, and now I'm in the middle of the fight day. What do you do? You do not engage the fight if God told you the fight belongs to him. If he's told you his plan, don't formulate your own and don't start defending yourself. Praise God in the middle of it because it confuses the enemy. Like, Just think through your life right now. Have you ever... Have you ever been engaging in sinful behavior while singing a worship song? Right? I come you out upon the water, and you're like sinning at the same time. No, like if you cannot engage with God in praise and worship, like you just can't. This is so is a thing about the way we've been designed. It's the same way like you can't say your address out loud and think your phone number in your head. So you can't declare truth about who God is and who he created you to be in your relationship and be thinking something that doesn't agree with what you're saying because God designed us so that our mouth overrides what's going on in our brain. Cuz death and life are in the power of the tongue. I know, I know, I've said that a lot, but I really want you to remember Proverbs 18, 21, because those who love the power of the tongue will eat its fruit, right? So we need to make sure that we are engaging in the fight song because we know that it will confuse our enemies. And I, I want you to notice as well that the Jewish people didn't even see the fight that was happening. The enemy started fighting amongst themselves. They didn't see it. All they saw, they got up to their lookout point, and all they saw was the results of God winning their battle for them. And so we need to stop waiting to praise God until we can see something happening. Like a lot of times I think that we get into these moments where we're believing God to do something, we've got a promise, and we'll kind of like step on the border of faithfulness and we'll go, okay, God, I, I believe you. And then we're watching for something to change. God is waiting for somebody to praise. Because it didn't say they started to praise as soon as they saw their enemies. It said as soon as they began to praise, their enemies turned on themselves. Right? Now, I don't know how this would play out in your exact situation because I'm not living your life, but I know some areas in my own life where there's been moments where I have waited for God to do a work, and he has said, Tim, why did you stop thanking me for the work I want to do in your life? And then I've began to praise, and then sure enough, that's when the phone call comes in that says, oh, this just happened to work out. Oh, this, just, this thing just happened, like this person just changed their mind, or this, this thing just changed your entire circumstance. This happened to me just recently. My wife and I were facing these issues, and, and, and I just stopped thanking God, and I just went, okay, God, I, I prayed, and I'm just going to stand in faith. Why is nothing happening, God? It's been weeks. Don't you remember I thanked you already? Deliver. And nothing happened. 
And then the Lord reminded me, why aren't you thanking me still? So I began to praise again. Just every time I thought about it, just every, nothing major changed in my life. I didn't, I didn't write a blog post about it or anything like that. I just, every time I just remembered this one situation, was, it was a big enough situation. It was like every day this thing would come in my mind once or twice a day. You know, those big mountain things. And instead of just saying, well, God, I thanked you then, I'm going to thank you now. And you know what happened? As soon as, we, as, as soon as I changed my mentality, as soon as I started thanking God, man, phone calls started coming in. Emails started being sent. All of a sudden, there was this one thing we were waiting for that was, it was just being hung up, and we had no idea why it was being hung up, and it was like the thing that was going to domino affect the rest of the situation. And that thing happened. It just happened. And, and I really, really, really believe that it happened because we started thanking God while we were in the middle of the fight. Instead of defaulting to what we thanked you. This is like the husband that stands at the altar and says, I love you and I'll commit to love you for the rest of your life. I'm never going to tell you that again. If I change my mind about how I love you, I'll let you know. That marriage will fall apart. Right? So you have to engage your mouth with your commitment and your conviction on a daily basis, right? Otherwise, things begin to get stuck. And by the way, if you're in a marriage or a relationship right now where you feel like things have been stuck and the gears of love aren't moving for you like they used to, I wonder what might happen if you just started giving your spouse some praise. I'm not saying that they're doing everything right, but I'm wondering if maybe you could praise them into doing some things right. No, I mean... A good fight doesn't sing, uh, a, good, a good fight song doesn't just prepare you for warfare. Let me say this to you, it doesn't just prepare you for warfare, it is warfare. A good fight song is your fight. That's it. A good fight song is your fight. Now, number three, let's move on to the third one. Uh, in verses 25 through 28, let me read to you the next thing that happens in this story. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder, because remember, all of these fools are dead now. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment because it was three armies and they found equipment and clothing and other valuables more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. And on the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the Valley of Blessing today. Then all the men returned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of harps, lyres, and trumpets, and they proceeded to the temple of the Lord. We'll get to the next two verses in just a minute, but I just want to share with you a few things that we can learn from this third fight song uh, we, we can learn first off, as we observe here, that the people didn't forget to praise God for their victory, and we should learn the same lesson. Don't forget to praise God after the victory. It's interesting how many of us will run to God in a crisis and in our victory act like we're the one that did it. Don't forget to praise God. How, how terrible would it have been if Jehoshaphat's like, God, I need your help desperately. Jehaziel gives a prophetic word. God's totally going to fight for you, so praise him. We praise God. It's going to be awesome. We line up at, to, to start marching out to the fight. Yeah, remember, God is going to fight our fight for us, right? It's totally God's fight, so just worship him. And at the moment that they start worshiping, the enemy starts attacking themselves. And then after that, they plunder for three days. And on the fourth day, King Jehoshaphat stands up and says, we're going to build a statue to me because I I'm the best king ever taking out three armies in one day like that. Man, oh me of such big faith. Suddenly, this story has a much different ending. I wonder how many of us sully the work of God in our lives because we actually trick ourselves into thinking that we did it when it was God who fought our fight for us. 
So remember this thing that I was talking to you about? It's, it's going to be important to, for, for my wife and I that when this big mountain thing that I was waiting for and I started praising God in the middle of it, when it's finally completely resolved and all done and we get to see all of the different ways that God has done miracles and they've already started, when this whole process is finally over, we can look back and say, that thing, that whole thing is completely done. God completely worked that, turned that around to our favor and our benefit. It's going to be important that we don't look at each other and go, man, we're so great and like high five and like celebrate what good people we are for coming through that situation. Be really important that we go, God, you're the one that gave us a promise before that ever started. You reminded us of your promise halfway through it. And so we've been praising you ever since and we're not going to stop praising you now. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done in my life. I wonder how many of us have a dry, stale, crusty relationship with Jesus because we've stopped thanking him for the work he did on the cross. I wonder how many of us get frustrated and feel like, man, God just isn't doing anything in my life anymore because you stopped praising him. Man, if, if I was trying to do nice things for you and you never said thank you, after a while, I'm going to get kind of tired of doing nice things for you. And God doesn't deal with the, with the pride issue that I deal with. But he does demonstrate the principle in the Bible that if, if you're not willing to be thankful after the fact, then God can't continue to bless your life. What a missed opportunity to give God some praise for something he has done. And if you can't think of a good thing that he's done for you, if you have a relationship with Jesus, that's the best thing that he's done for you. And it's still relevant today. Amen? All right, so they didn't forget to praise God after the victory. The second thing that that I observed in this passage and that we can learn here is that they recognized that their post-fight position was to be a valley of blessing. I I love that, that that they didn't walk out of the victory uh, and, and act like they were victims. A lot of times we walk through and God gives us a victory and we actually spend more time telling the story of how we got beat up and we just you know, suffered through me and Jesus, and we're just here by the skin of our teeth. Like, you're telling the wrong story, bro. Tell the story about how God saved your life. I'm not saying that you've never been a victim of anything. Just don't tell the story about how you're still a victim when you're not anymore. If God's given you the victory, don't be a victim. And so the people of Israel didn't walk out of that fight and go, oh, isn't it rough to be us? So many people attacked us. That was hard. That just was really hard to be not liked like that. Man, everybody constantly just trying to take out God's people. It's just really hard to be us. Thank God that he saved us from not being liked like that. No, they didn't at all. They praised God, and they actually turned the valley of the fight into a valley of blessing. But notice that they named the valley of blessing not because God had blessed them, but because they blessed God in that place. Listen to the verse again. It says, on the fourth day, they gathered in the valley of blessing, which got its name that day, not because they won a fight. It got that name to that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. This is important. In other words, you've not fully engaged in your blessing until you've given God thankful praise for it. And so if you walk out of a fight and you are playing the victim, I'm not saying that you never were one, But if you still act like one after you're a victor, then you've not fully engaged in your blessing. Because the culmination of every victory is that you come back to the place and you praise God for giving you the victory. And you change the name from the valley of three armies didn't like us and tried to attack us here and we were totally going to lose except by the skin of our teeth God saved us, which is exhausting to say. And you call it the valley of of blessing. Oh, why is it the Valley of Blessing? Don't go back to the story. Say, it's the Valley of Blessing because this is the place where we were able to praise and bless 
God. Well, why were you able to praise and bless God? Oh, well, let me tell you that story. It's actually because there's this dope story about how we didn't have to fight a fight. It was awesome. God totally fought our fight for us because he's the best. And, like, all we had to do was praise and sing some songs. Oh, my goodness, it's amazing. And every time I think about that story, about what he did for us, it just makes me want to praise him. In fact, will you come back to the Valley of Blessing with me and just praise right now because of the story? By the way, this is called a testimony in church culture. We call that a testimony where you get to tell your praise to somebody else so that they come back to the Valley of Blessing. And they don't see that this is the valley of the place where, oh, my goodness, three armies tried to attack us because they didn't like us that day. And just by the skin of our teeth and God's grace and mercy, you know, we made it the valley of blessing because it becomes a place where you get to invite the people around you into the blessing of being a praiser of the most high God so change the name of your valley from the valley of skin of my teeth to the valley of blessing the valley of I'm just getting by to the valley of blessing the valley of, <laughs> I'm going to get the religious people here for just a second. The valley of, there but by the grace of God go I. Which is a church way to say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, my life sucks too. It was just the grace of God. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. You only love God because he loved you first. You live in the valley of blessing because you obeyed him. You did that, right? Now he's blessed you, so you get to be a blessing, a blesser. How do you do that? You praise in the valley that used to be the valley of the battle, and you turn it into the valley of blessing, and then you invite other people so you can invite them into the blessing that is to get to praise God. A lot of times we're telling the wrong story. Tell the story of how you get to praise God. Amen? There's a third thing here. The third lesson is this, uh, that they praised and marched. They had a praise march, like, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, what's, why am I blanking on the word? For a parade, thank you. A parade. I go to a lot of parades, apparently. I can't even remember the word. They had a parade to what? To where? The temple, right? Now, the Old Testament temple, we've learned this already. The Old Testament temple was a building. The New Testament temple is a person. It's the believer, the heart of the believer. It's you and me. If you put your faith in Jesus, right? Now, what that means in New Testament context is that they praised corporately, publicly, together. All of God's people praised in the temple. They praised where the temple gathers. So they actually took their praise from the Valley of Blessing, and they said, oh, we got to make sure the whole family gets in on this praise. And they went to the temple. They went back to, can I tell you the, the 2018 uh, lesson that you should learn? Stop being late for church. <laughs> this is the 2018 instruction that your pastor is going to give you in light of this message. We worship God corporately for a reason. It's not a buffer so you can be late to get in time for the message. We do it so that you, we do it for you so that you can praise God together right so stop being late we start church at 10 a.m and when i say we start church i mean the band strikes up a, a, a an instrument and they begin to sing songs not because it's a concert that you could miss if you want but it's corporate praise which is vitally important because if you don't show up for the praise gathering then stop trying to tell everybody your story because you didn't show up for the moment where we all get to praise god together it's funny how we all want the attention on our own story, but we won't join the corporate worship. I, I want to I I praise publicly, and I'm not saying that praising publicly on your Facebook account is bad. I'm saying if you want to brag about what God has done for your life, but refuse to praise him with all the other people in your church family that God has done stuff for, you're being a little selfish. So show up to church on time. Now, if I just super offended you and this is the last time you come to Life Church because I can't believe that pastor told us, that's fine. Honestly, it's totally fine. Absolutely fine. Whatever church you begrudgingly decide to go to next Sunday, find out what time their service starts and show up on time. 
and, and, I, and I know, I, I know, I know this seems like a ridiculous point, and you're thinking like, why, is it, why does it actually matter? If God is changing your life, it shouldn't be hard to get into the presence of God with God's people and give Him thanks. In fact, it should be hard to miss it. It should be hard to miss it. And I know our church culture says, I mean, all the church studies say, you know, people come to church like once, maybe twice, if you're a super Christian, every month. And, and I'm not saying that your kids shouldn't join the football league in town, and, you know, if they schedule a game on Sunday that you shouldn't go be with your kids. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't take vacations. I, I'm not saying that you should never, ever not be at church. I'm saying if you're going to be here, be all the way here, Right? Because these people said, this blessing is so good, I've got to take it back to the temple. And in the New Testament, we understand the temple is God's people. So for us, what that means is when God blesses your life, I've got to go thank God at the te- like with the temple, with people. And you should praise him by yourself, and then you should praise him corporately. And if you only ever show up half the time, what happens if God gives a prophetic word during song number one? you wouldn't even know. And what if that was the thing that could change your life, but you showed up late for the battle? I'm just saying, stop being late to church. And (laughs) Mike really likes this point. (laughs) Look, 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 look. (laughs) He said, I confess. That's funny. Here's the, here's the thing. Look, before you start thinking that Life Church just got like religious with your schedule, Romans chapter eight says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's none. There's no condemnation. So if you feel bad because of what I just said, that's on you. I'm not trying to condemn you, right? Mike's late and he thinks this is funny. <laughs> but we're we're committed to be here on time because we want to give God all of our best all the time, right? So like when we take kids up to camp, we say rule rule number whatever out of five is be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. And where we're supposed to be when the church calls a gathering to worship is be there to worship, right? Cool? All right, I just felt like I needed to say that this morning because Here's the thing. I think that if God can trust us to thank him together, that he'll give us victories together. And one of the things that, this this is really the the point, is that one of the things that God wants to do with this church is to use this church, Life Church, not the building, the people. He wants to use the unity of our hearts to change our community, right? And if we're not unified in our praise, then God can't trust us to be unified in our warfare. If we're not unified in our learning and in our worship, then he can't trust us to be unified in our evangelism. So we need to be unified across the board completely. There's no room for disunity, which means there's no room for people to say, that's my church, but I'll show up on my terms, right? And if you don't like the terms, if you don't like what time we start, look, go to Bible college, plan a church, and start at whatever time you want. But this, like, we start at 10, <laughs> Why? Because unity matters in our praise. And if you think I'm harping on the point, I've only said this in like one sub point of one sermon. I've been a senior pastor for seven years. I've wanted to say that every Sunday forever. Right? So if you're like, when all he cares about is we show up on time. No, imagine the number of times I wanted to say it and I didn't. But today was appropriate. <laughs> all right? Good. I'm not going to make you say the mantra that you'll all be here on time or anything like that. But it is important that we worship together. Amen? Here's the point of this entire message, is that this story, just like our lives, would go so much differently if we don't engage in the fight song, if we don't worship God, right? So let me ask you a couple of questions as we're beginning to wrap up. The first question is this. When you see a fight coming your way, do you give God praise or do you start to make a plan? Do you give God praise when you see a fight coming, or do you start to make a plan? 
that's going to be a good indication of how you're doing on this point. Now, second question is just simply, are you in a fight right now? If you're in a fight right now, like you feel like you're facing a thing right now, spiritual warfare or relational challenge or whatever it is, you feel like you're in a fight. Instead of watching for the changes before you praise, are you praising right in the middle of it, whether you can see it or not? So if, if you're in the middle of a fight and you've started to grab a hold of worry and let go of the promise, if that's you, then you know what I need to do is I need to go grab that promise again and you start declaring it right in the middle of my fight, right? And remember this, we are never fly fighting against flesh and blood right? So you need a spiritual fighting style. So if you feel like people are attacking you, it's just getting tired because the same people over and over again, praise, pray in the spirit. Amen. And the third question is, is have you seen God give you a victory? Remember the first victory, if you're a Christian is I am alive and I have life for eternity. That's the first victory. So yes, I have seen God give me a victory, but is there another, another place? If God is given you a victory you owe him payment for that victory and that payment is your praise so you have you been praising god as payment for the victory that he's already given you i would challenge you to make your praise public share your story with people and make your praise corporate come and join your family in your praise all right now i want to just take a moment and end this service like this uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up with some with with one or two quick elements and then we're gonna be done. But I think it's important that we do this. Could you just stand to your feet if you're physically able to do so today? And I want to just challenge you for a moment because uh, I've been talking about praise and worship and I've been talking about making it verbal. And a lot of times when we say we praise, we start making all kinds of other noise. I just want to say if you're gonna clap, you're gonna do whatever. That's that's fine. You make all kinds of other noise in this moment but make sure this, that something is coming out of your mouth if you want to engage in this moment. I just want to invite you before we wrap up today uh, to make a verbal praise to God. Uh, the praise is for one of three reasons, or maybe all three reasons. For the promise of a future victory that he's given you. And if you don't know what the word is yet, he's got a promise for future victory so you can praise him. God, I, believe, I, I thank you that you're going to tell me how you're going to win my fight for me. Praise him for the fight that you're already in, for fighting your fight for you. If you feel like you're in the middle of it, just right now begin to say thank you to him for fighting your fight for you or thank him for something he's done. Go ahead, just out of your mouth. What, however that resonates for you, however that lands for you, I just want to invite you to begin to thank God right now. You could be as loud or as quiet as you want. If you feel like you need to shout some thanks to God, you can go ahead and do that. If you want to clap and partner your, your praise and thanksgiving with some clapping and some adoration, you can do that too. But God, we just thank you today. We thank you so much today for who you are, for what you've done for us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Jesus, I want to thank you with my whole family for the, the, the victory that you've already given us when you sent your son and you had him live a perfect sin-free life for us and that he's alive because he's the son of God who was sent because he loves us, that his love for us paid the price for our life. God, I just want to thank you for that. I want to say thank you, God. God, I want to say thank you for every area where my friends and I are facing a fight. I want to give you praise right now, believing that you will confuse our enemies and begin to turn victory around in our favor. God, I thank you in advance. I thank you for the ways you're doing that in our lives. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you for the victory. Before we ever see the fight coming, we say thank you in advance that you're already our source of victory before any fight ever begins. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. You're such a good God. Praise you, Lord. And while you're still standing right there, I just want to pray a blessing over you. And it's going to come right here from these last two verses in this story. It says, when all the surrounding kingdoms heard the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. And so God, I pray for my friends who are fighting, my, my friends who are going to face a fight, my friends who have seen a fight and who've seen victory in it. I, I pray for my friends who 
who the last time they were in a fight experienced failure, but are going to learn how to win the next time around. God, I pray for all of my friends right now, God, that you would win their battles for them. God, I declare in the name of Jesus that you would give my friends and my family members in this place, everybody who would watch online now or later on and would agree with this prayer and this blessing, I pray a blessing over them that you would give them peace, that you would give them rest, and that you would even win in their life in such a way that other people would see it and that other people would be in awe of your work in and through their lives. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring those in the middle of a fight into victory and into a season of peace and rest. And God, I pray for those that have feel, felt like they've been fighting on the same battleground for years and years and years, and they keep finding victory and then failure and victory and failure. I pray for a breaking of the cycle in Jesus' name, that there would be sustainable peace and rest in that battlefield and that the battle of sin becomes the valley of blessing that the battle of brokenness and poverty and, and depression and isolation becomes the the valley of blessing that you would change the name of that fighting ground forever in jesus name thank you lord and god grow your church with people who are passionate about praising you in every season in jesus name one more time can we say thank you to god and give him some praise for everything he's done today in jesus name in jesus name